we are being recorded. Okay. I just moved that so in case that Crawford needed to come out. That'd be great as moderate. Okay, so welcome. Welcome to the self session on um, promotion and tenure, understanding promotion and tenure, and I think I call this Tales from the Trenches. So yesterday, and I don't think any of you, well, one of you were able to join us on, two of you were able to join us on yesterday. We had a, a, a slightly larger crowd, but obviously the topic in and of itself generates a lot of interest. And so we recorded that and put it up. We want to do the same today for folks who may be interested. And these tales from the trenches, what I've tried to do was get representatives who have, um, or panelists, I should say, who have undergone the promotion and tenure process within the last two to three years. Um, no, no more than three, and if they went through it last semester, that's perfect, fine, the sooner the better. Um, and so, from different colleges. And today, you'll, you'll get to meet folks from different colleges. We have another one a week from today with the other remaining representatives from the colleges um, that, have, that aren't here today. I always like to have a moderator on hand. We have a moderator, and our moderator for the panel session today is Dr. Steve Crawford. Dr. Crawford is a professor in the School of Music. Well, not School of Music. We, we're working on getting a School of Music, right, but the, right, right now, College of Visual and Performing Arts, but he'll probably get some type of big donor to get a name school. <laughs> probably the, the Stephen, I'm gonna give you a middle initial, initial, Stephen L. Crawford School of Music at Mary Harden Baylor, and the whole building erected in his honor. And so, um, but he's gonna moderate, and the reason that we have moderators, that I decided to have a moderator, I felt it was important to have faculty who could share their experiences and luckily for you who have agreed to pass around their materials. So those will be floating and passing around as they're talking. Um, I'll pass mine around. I underwent the process last semester. We'll be going up for tenure. Um, October 15th, those materials are due. But I'm going to pass up around those materials as well. So do take a listen, but we thought that's one of the valuable things that you can get out of it. Another one is the opportunity to ask questions. So we have Dr. Crawford here, who is a member of Promotion and Tenure, has been in the past. I'm, I'm not sure if you are now. Yes. She is now, too. That's excellent. Um, but he knows about the process inside and out. And, and what I'd like for you to do, before we get started, he's going to introduce himself a little better and tell you these things that I'm saying. He's going to ask them to introduce themselves. But what I'd like from you is for you to say your name, which college or and department you're from, or in, and then tell the number of years you've been here at Mary Harden Baylor, if in fact it's been a year. For some people it won't have been, but a few months, and that's good. So we're just happy to have you. So name, college, or department, and then how long you've been at UMHB. And we'll go with Dr. Gonzalez first. Carla Gonzalez, Modern Foreign Languages, three years. Okay. Haiti Liu, Modern Foreign Languages, two years. Yone Udostawa. College of Humanities and Sciences and the Biology Department, and this is uh, my third year here, my second year as a tenure track. Excellent. Uh, Robert Pendergraft, Department of Music, and this is my first semester. Sarah <laughs> Hedishak in uh, CVPA, and I'm in the art department, and this is my second year. Beto, um, in the art department as well, and this is the start of my fifth year, I guess, four years here. Donna Slack, math department, mm -hmm. first after being, I, I was here back 10 uh -huh. years ago. Uh-huh, very good. <laughs> and I think, you know, kudos to you because she's our only adjunct to attend so far. So we appreciate that out of interest. And you know, we never know what that will lead to. And so we're happy to have her here and join us as well. I'll turn it over to Dr. Crawford, who will ask them to introduce himself. Tell us those things you wanted to know, and then he'll let the group, the panelists, do the same. And if Dr. Carrie Johnson from Nursing Comms, we'll just let her join right in. Sure. All right, I'm Dr. Stephen Crawford. Uh, as Dr. Eaton said, I'm from the uh, College of Visual and Performing Arts Music Department, and uh, where I teach uh, all of the music histories. I'm director of percussion studies, so when you're out there and you look at the drumline guys and all the percussion in the, in the bands, that's, those are a lot of my, my students. And uh, uh, this is my 16th year, 17th, 16th year at UMHB, okay, uh, 35th year, uh, 34th year overall in higher education. So I've been through the tenure process 
uh, at one other institution besides this one. When I went through the tenure process and promotion process here, I've only been through the promotion process once here because I came in as an associate professor. Mm -hmm. So I had to do my, kind of like the military, you do your time and grade, you have to spend so much time at the, the rank that you're at. Uh, before you can move on. So I was there, I think, an associate professor for six years before I was able to apply uh, for promotion. And then the year after that, once I became full professor, then I was also eligible then for, uh, for tenure, uh, for the tenure uh, ranking. Um, at that time, we had separate full professor tenure applications. Now, if you're, I think if you're up for one, you're automatically up for the other, and one process takes place. So in a way, it's a little easier because you only have to do it once, and back in the old days, we had to actually do it twice, which created a lot of redundancies in a way. Um, but the process changed in 2014 with new policies that came out of the Dean's Council. Um, I think it was 2010, 2011, I was coming off of faculty president with the faculty assembly, the old faculty assembly. Uh, and I think you were the last president of the faculty assembly. No, I was the first president of the You were the council. first president of the, the faculty council. So as we went from faculty assembly to faculty council, many of our policies changed. Um, I was sitting at the time when we were creating the policies on policies. Now, if you want to get into academic <laughs> double speed, this is, this was the, these were the meetings you wanted to come in on. Our policies on policies and having to create and write new policies at that time, this is where we started developing the new procedures for promotion and for tenure and to clear the hurdles of, um, of the faculty and such. So it's a little different from when I went through it. I sit on the committee now, so um, a lot of the portfolios now do come to, to me and the committee, but the process is totally different from when I actually went through it. So I'm seeing things from a whole different perspective. The way that I went through it, my tales from the trenches, no longer exist. Okay, they're fairy tales from the trenches now because they no longer exist. These are the true tales over here because they've gone through the, the new process that you are now under as of, I think, June of 2014. Okay? Right. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Stephen and Kurt, let them introduce themselves, and they're going to kind of take over and I'll moderate as the title says. Go from there. Uh, I'm Kurt Fisher, and uh, I'm uh, teach over in the College of Business. I'm an accounting professor. I'm also this year the Associate Dean of Graduate Programs uh, you know, within the College of Business. And so I've got the basically the MBA and the MSI program. So uh, all those Indians who turn around the campus. Like, uh, I've been here, this is my seventh year. I came here originally as an instructor and I had not defended my, I'm a late in life uh, uh, I have a DBA, a Doctor of Business Administration, but that all came to me late in life. I came out of a corporate career for 29 years before I came here. And so I worked for a couple of years with a master's degree and finally defended and now I'm here and doing my thing. So uh, my timeline, uh, actually my first two years here did not really contribute toward uh, my time and rank and such because of my contracts basically said, uh, teach well and get your terminal degree or leave. You know, that was essentially the, the language in my contract. So well, we finished that up and then I started my four year in, as assistant uh, professor and such. And then it was a little over a year ago that I got the notice from Steve Oldham that it was time to put my, my, my dual package together. And I think this, I think Lynn wanted this just sort of hand these around, so I'm happy to do that. So I ended up putting together, um, this is both a pre-tenure review and an application for promotion all in one, which, to, to your point, made a lot of sense to me to do that. Now, uh, my degree is a DBA, so a DBA, the difference between a DBA and a PhD is a lot more emphasis on teaching, a lot, there's less emphasis on research. So only about a quarter of my degree was in research, and the rest of it was in things like pedagogy, and then of course, obviously, your topic matter uh, and such. And so, uh, and I came here to teach. I, that was my goal. I did not want to be a researcher. I wanted to be a teacher uh, and such. And so, if you look at this, you'll see uh, scant evidence of professional development. I, I do enough to sort of be credible, but I'm much more focused on, um, on teaching and such. And so you'll see within mine a lot of emphasis and discussion about what I've done in teaching and what I've done to innovate and pedagogy and things like that. And that was under the advice, Colin Wilborn, uh, 
help mentor me through the process, Dr. Wilmore, and basically said, hit your strengths, man. And, you know. uh, the other thing that I had fortunately done is I had kept every thank you note and every, you know, you know, get the little thing sometimes like Dean's Council, your name was mentioned or one of those kinds of things. And I had kept every one of those and you'll see in there I had, I made copies of all, I scanned them all, put them in there because apparently that helps, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So, um, it, uh, I have to say I was, uh, I was raised in the Lutheran church and Presbyterian now, I'm married to Presbyterian, so I kind of, mm -hmm. but uh, that background is one that frowns on self-promotion and frowns on holding yourself up as anything special. And this whole process was uncomfortable. You know, oh, look at me. Aren't I great? You know, uh, but at the end, that's really what you got to do. You got to suck it up and say, look at me. Aren't I great? Yeah. So. Yeah, I could echo that last sentiment especially. It's, um, uh, the kind of colleagues that you would want to work beside might not be the ones who are the best at self-promotion. So it is kind of a paradox yeah. um, to be in this spot. But I, I'm Stephen Barnes, and I'm, um, I teach over at, uh, in the College of, or the, or the New College of Humanities and Sciences English Department. Um, this is my sixth year at UMHB. Um, I've been in higher ed now uh, one decade. This is starting my second decade this year. <laughs> um, I've been in education since 1993. I started as an ESL teacher a couple of years overseas. Um, and then I was in classical Christian schools at the secondary level for a few years. And then in uh, 2000, I, I went back to grad school and have ended up here. Uh, had stops along the way at College of the Ozarks in Shorter, and then one year in Latvia. Um, and uh, so what am I, what should I say about the process? I, um, I came in with some credit towards promotion, but no credit towards tenure. So after um, two years at UMHB, I applied for, uh, or I put together a portfolio for um, promotion and am now associate. And um, right now, I, I'm, I'm, I think I came in the same year as uh, Dr. Eaton, so uh, I'm putting together the portfolio now for tenure. And, and so this is the paper version, and the new one that I'm doing now is all going to be electronic, which is um, much, much easier. Um, it does require that I go back and scan things in that I, I put together just two years ago or three years ago, but it's still, it's still worth it, I think, because um, there'll be another stage of this when you go from associate to full, but updating what's, what's there electronically will be much easier, I think. If, if I may ask, um, since this is promotion and tenure, which really are two different things, because you may have to go through the promotion a couple times before you're even eligible for the for the tenure if you don't mind showing hands uh, how many of you are considered tenure track okay so this the tenure portion of this is, is really going to affect you you're all on promotion or in, and eligible for that um, how many uh, at the instructor level at this point none okay assistant professor okay associate Okay, and there's no fools or you wouldn't be here. Okay. So, your assistant. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see the hand. So, um, one of the things you're going to want to make sure that you that you understand, I think, is how long you have to sit at each level before you're eligible to move on. So, as both Kirk and Stephen were saying, the, the the collection of your artifacts, basically, this is what it is. It's a collection of your career and yes it can be appearing like look at me I'm tooting my own horn and how great I am or you can look at it from this is what I've done um, and being kind of just proud of your your output your work and so that collection of artifacts becomes really important and as Kurt said even the most minimal thing of a letter from the Dean's Council or even a letter from a parent a student saying this was remarkable thank you so much for all the work I used to at one point just go oh that was nice and I checked it until my wife, who had gone through promotion and tenure before I did, uh, here go, no, 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 keep all of that because it goes to show your collegiality with either colleagues, because sometimes we'll get a nice note from, from a colleague, thank you for the performance, you, you helped out so much. And, and we, don't, we may not think of that as much, but to somebody on the committee, because one of the hardest things that we do um, is trying to, it's easy to judge your academic output. I can sit and count your publications. Quantifiable things are easy. 
One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you got five publications. They're pretty good at publication. Okay. But when it comes to collegiality, unless we have something that shows you're a great person and you work well with the, the, the old kindergarten, I play and work well with others type thing, unless we have that, it's really difficult to maybe judge from just a letter from your chairman or even worse, from your dean, because I don't see my dean. I work more closely with my chairman than I do my dean. I see my dean at evaluation time, and that's about it. Okay. Others ha may have a close relationship, but they may not have a lock on you like your just your, your colleague. So even though that's not an official letter from tenured faculty members and all that kind of stuff that comes in, these little thank you notes and just, golly, thanks for being here on Monday. You really helped out. can go a long way on showing that collegiality because it's really the hardest thing for parents. One of the things I did, go ahead. Go ahead. I wanna, uh, it's actually a question I have, but I think it might be one that others have as well. My understanding is that promotion is your time uh, as, as, a, as an instructor, teacher, professor at any institution, but tenure is at the particular institution you're at but present, right? It yeah. can be. Okay. Well, could you explain like, what the. Yes. Tenure, I mean, Obviously, tenure is a university's way of saying we value you and we want to keep you. Okay? And in order to get to that point, um, time has to be put in so they can judge over a period of time, not a one-year fluke. Oh, wow, that was a great year. Here's your tenure. And then the next year, you know. So it is, a, it, is a, it is a process. There are some professors, not much anymore, but uh, there was, I know of one professor. I had tenure at another institution. And sometimes you can bring tenure with you. It just depends on the institution and what they think of that institution. We did. We do still have one professor. I'm not going to say who it is, but who came in as a. This is a teacher. This is not a dean or not on the academic hierarchy side. Who came in as a full professor and fully tenured day one. Who's never gone through the process. That doesn't happen. Okay, um, that's almost unheard of, really, to come in. You may be coming in, and even deans have to still apply when they come in for tenure. They may have a shorter time frame, but they will still have to apply for uh, promotion. Sometimes deans will come in as a full professor, but they don't come in with being tenured. They still have to go through that. Yeah, through that in the college of business, we've got a couple of those. And we've got one right now who is fully tenured, full professor elsewhere, came in as an associate, and is on a, I forget how many years, but it's, it's a fairly short time frame. But to your point, mm -hmm. there needs to be some level of comfort that this exactly. that this is a keeper sort of thing exactly. you know, for the university. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So with that being said, though, does that mean that you only submit materials or work that you've done for the tenure process since you've been here at Mary Harden Baylor, or is it? Um, Still, more holistic process where you would where you would present stuff, you know, from the, the key material that that the committee normally looks. And there's no there's no really set in stone policy of, of what you can submit. Mm -hmm. um, but the major, I think it, you you would be wise to have the great majority of your material going into your packets being from when you were at this institution. And it kind of goes back into the what have you done for me lately thing. Yes, your award that you won 20 years ago is great, and yet that was 20 years ago. Now, having said that, there are sometimes outside elements depending on, especially if you're publishing through outside things, um, you hold endorsements with other music companies, music dealers, it would be like an athlete having a shoe deal, okay. That has nothing to do with this institution, but if you're endorsed by Nike, yeah, you're gonna put, you're gonna wanna put that in because it also shows what you're doing, taking the university <coughs> to the outside world and vice versa. So, um, outside publications, my symphony performances that have nothing to do with here, that all goes in because it is when I'm spending my time here, even though it may not be 100% linked to the institution, and we're we're all we all kind of do that in the business world. You may do I ideas. Yeah, I, I included. Uh, yeah, I had a 29-year corporate career, and I had some trade publications and other things that I had been involved in, and then also I'd just been vice president of a couple of software companies. And in our college, that's a useful thing to have been that, that you can bring that with you. 
Uh, and so in my overall, it didn't make up a big part of it, but part of it, uh, I put in effectively my professional resume as part of my CV, if you will, and said, you know, I've got, I've got this six year CV of all these things I've done academically, but oh, by the way, before I got here, I did all this. Mm -hmm. you know, and it didn't, as I said, didn't make a lot of it, but I, you know, I'm, I'm adding it. It does matter. There was, there were, oh, Stephen, did you? No. Okay, there was, there was a time. <laughs> You ever seen that show on like I forget it's on TLC where it's quarters? I was I used to be an academic quarter. I mean I still had on my resume because, especially when I hadn't cleaned it out for a while. Once I had gotten the promotion tenure, there's a tendency not to update stuff because I don't have to anymore because I'm not up for anything anymore uh, at the uh, at the institute. So somebody said, well why don't you send us an updated you know your your latest vita? And I, I'm looking at it, I'm seeing things from 19. 83. It's like, what is that still doing on here? Oh my gosh. I was just out of school. It was a grad school or something like that. And I had to go through and kind of, you know, do spring cleaning of my resume and everything and just dump a bunch of stuff that that was not needed. Now, if it said Nobel Prize 1983, that's staying on there. I don't care how old that is. But, you know, some outstanding grad student for the fall semester, that was gone. That was important when I was first trying to find a gig, but, but not anymore. Have, do they know about where the policies are? Have you already covered that? No. So if they've seen it in New Faculty Academy, but it, it would never hurt to show them again. The other thing, the other question that I have for the panelists and for the moderator, if I may ask, is about um, like teaching evaluations and so forth. About how many do you put in? Do you put in a representation, a sample? You know, because if you're teaching a heavy load for classes a semester over the course of five, five years, that's 20 of those things. And we're not even talking if you taught summer and have some. So can you talk a little bit about how you made decisions and did you only put the ones where you had really high feedback scores and, you know? I you put, I, I made a summary in a, big, in a table that fit on one page for the idea scores and then the next page was the pre-idea uh -huh. score. And I put every score um, you know, basically the teaching of it, there was three scores that you get, you know, on the one to five scale. And I put every one, made a little table, here's the course, and here are my three scores, and here's the course, here are my three scores. And on the right hand side, I put uh, uh, the most favorable comment I got and the least favorable comment I got, because I didn't want to have an appearance I was trying to hide something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I had a few pretty snarky comments, you know, you know, you know, you know he's a smart aleck. Okay, well, I guess maybe I am. And, um, uh, and such, and then, then in one of them where a student uh, really laid into me on, on one particular habit I had in the class, I did make a comment at the bottom and said, I learned from that one, I don't, I don't do that anymore, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and such, because the student apparently felt demeaned by something that I didn't pick up on at all, uh, and such. So yeah, I included everything mm -hmm. that I had. Now for me, that's only set, was only, when I did this, it was five and a half years worth, so that's not a lot. But I put everything. Stephen, I, I think I'm uh, for for the promotion. I, I really don't remember what I did, but I can look and, and tell you. But I know that as I'm preparing for tenure, I I am going to include all of them. Um, but I like her. I, I have a table that's sort of a um, uh, you know it's, it, it, gives, it gives an overview. But I am going to, going to include it all in those scanned, uploaded documents. So, uh, that, and that's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You the summers. One of the uh, one of the things that I know the committee looks for is consistency. So, if you're going to add, which I recommend you do, if you're going to add those IDA scores or your student evaluation scores, a red flag is raised when we have 2013, 2014, 2016, mm -hmm. and all yeah. of a sudden 2015 yeah. is missing, and we're going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was this an oversight, or is there a reason 2015 is mm -hmm. missing mm -hmm. from this? And as a committee member, now I'm not the chair, but our chair has given us the charge that when something like this comes up, we have the literally the obligation to the institution to go to the either the chair of the person or to the dean and say, uh, we're missing some some material here. We need that mm -hmm. in order to find out. So. That, that has not happened much. It's happened a couple times since I've been here. This is my second time on the committee in the 16 years. Um, and But it is one of those red flags that 
you know, is going to, we want to know why is 2015 left out. And normally when we get that, 2015 was a bad year, uh, either on scores or students, which for a lot of, you know, for anybody, that could be a devastating thing. You know, you get the snarky comments, you can blow those up, but if it's consistent and you know that's happening, sometimes that's hard for us to admit, you know, that this is out there. But uh, our, our, our chair, uh, Renata Hood, also says, though, we need to see those because if 2000, let's say the bad evaluation in 2013, yes, that's horrible, but 2014 was a little better, 2015 was even better, it shows a process of growth. We're all going to have those valleys, but we're also going to have mountains too, and we just hope those mountains follow the valleys instead of the other way around where it's totally declined. But um, a lot of times those bad evaluations can also be a kind of insight to your, to your growth pattern as well, that everything, oh, well, look, this is what it was in 2013, but look what they're doing. 14, there's 15. This shows improvement as a teacher, and that's what we really are looking for. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking for, for growth and, and uh, transparency. I think it's really, really important on that. And as Stephen was saying, and um, these are, are now museum pieces that you're looking at right now. We don't do this anymore. Um, everything is now submitted um, e-portfolio uh, for tenure and for promotion. This was something we. Uh, uh, kind of beta tested last year on the promotion end. We're going to be going doing it now with the tenure. Um, and there, there's a couple reasons. One, it's easier for the committee. I can sit in my office now, and any you know any time I have, I can pull up somebody's uh, packet. Before they were, and this was like you know hermetically sealed on you know Funkin' Wagner's porch in the mayonnaise jar type of thing, and then we had to come over to the vault and open it, and you know only one person could be. And it was it was a headache. And any time we had a meeting, imagine 15 people up for promotion. These binders are big. We have some very, very energetic go-getter people. And some people had two to three binders. Mm -hmm. You know, and where they were not saying they're public, they were giving us the publication. I mean, they were really trying to a 100-page document on this one binder alone. You know, I don't need to see the entire dissertation. And it, we were literally dragging wagons, you know, the little kid wagon full of binders around campus so we could have our meeting. So the e-portfolio really now is, is the way we're going to do. And as Stephen said, the difficulty now, instead, you're just going to hoard a different way. You're going to hoard electronically instead of paper files, which in, in a way is even better because now you've got backup, you've got the e-portfolio, you can chunk the originals if you want it on those types of things keep everything electronic. So just know what you're looking at is, we're gonna see this electronically, it's gonna be in the same categories and such, university service, your um, teaching effectiveness, everything that goes into your evaluation, those categories are still there, it's just going to be electronically submitted from here on out. Um, right. Oh, I was just gonna, and, and many of you have probably already seen this and I don't I mean to be redundant. I'm not short time, <laughs> Can I, can but I if you if you go online, oh yes, sir. yeah. About that, you know, like an article. If you have a primary article now, since we're doing the e-portfolio format, mm -hmm. would it be good to include the PDF of that article in there? Yeah, I think or it's link, a, yeah, or we I mean, you actually have more storage space now yeah. because you know instead of this you have yeah. you know whatever's out there in the cybersphere. You know, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's a limit on how much yeah. memory is on there, but yeah, yeah I think. Oh, so you've got enough room that okay. you could actually probably do that. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Um, and it's kind of your own, you, you know what we need to see. You know, do we need, actually need to see all eight chapters? I think you're, you know. But I, we'd like to maybe see more than just the abstract. On something. If you have questions for Dr. Crawford or members of the committee, don't don't wait for them to say, it's time for questions, just ask the questions like yeah. Dr. Lostalo did. So. So go to my campus, and then under academic affairs, we have things, to do, those of you who are advisors, we go under there to find our students, faculty, that's all your class lists and how you integrate and all that kind of stuff. But under academic affairs, this becomes really, really important. And over here, you're gonna see the policies. And this is everything we did for the last few years on this policies on policies. And a lot of this was born out of uh, litigation. We had to make sure we had something documented, written down, so anytime faculty, staff, students come and say, well, wait a minute, you, ah, yes, we did. It's right there. Okay? So underneath it are the promotion and tenure documents. 
And basically what this is, and I downloaded them here to mirror, but we don't have it here to serve on this, but it, we'll just click on the promotion. And as you can see, the effective date for this is as of 2014. And this is when the, the Dean's Committee, through the faculty assembly and all of the people that are writing the policies on policies, this is when it was solidified. Um, and it used to say, uh, and I think, yeah, this selection applies to all faculty hired on or after June of 2014, which I think is all of you, maybe David, you were before this, before. right? Okay, so he could actually go back to the last policy. This is kind of like what catalog you came in on as a student. So other than David, most of you were hired after June 14, no, even earlier? Okay, so those of you hired after 14, this is the document, okay? Um, I would probably go by this document, even if you were hired before, compare the two, and see it's like degree plans for students, which is much further down. Is, is there, okay, there is. all right. So you, this is the, um, all of the, uh, the rankings, the definitions of this, and how to do it, instructor to assistant, master's degree, at least 18 hours successful graduate work in the field, completed five years of successful teaching at the instructor level. So if you came in at the instructor level, you're not gonna have to worry except collecting all of your documents to go into a portfolio, but you're gonna have no action for at least five years or something, okay? Um, tenure's going to be a little bit different, and I'm not gonna read this to you here, um, but this, okay, now we get to this section applies to faculty hired prior to. So therefore, thank you, there, there are two sets of languages that in that one document will cover the people who've been here a little longer and then the new people. So just find where your hire date was and, and you go from there. Okay. So that has everything to do there. This is the biggie, non-tenure track faculty must apply for promotion when they have met the degree and time in requirements. In other words, we have had people, and I've got some dear colleagues that have fallen under the old thing that are still assistant professors and have been here 20 some odd years. Well, at that point, even if they're non-tenure track, they should at least be at the associate professor. In years before, if you didn't want to apply for associate professor, you didn't have to apply for associate professor. Now, you don't have a choice. Non-tenure faculty must apply for promotion. In other words, you don't get to sit back and not be evaluated for promotion and just go, I'm just gonna sit as assistant professor and do nothing and just hang out here. When your time comes up for associate professor, you will apply for associate professor. There's no more sitting back and just relaxing, okay? So you will always be notified by the office of the provost at which time you are now eligible. That's a nice word of saying you've got to apply for the next rank, but you are now eligible for this. Same with tenure, and that normally comes, I think now, at least a year in advance because you go through the pre-tenure process, okay? Uh, and the pre-tenure process is exactly that. It's like a student handing in a paper for editing first. You don't hand in the rough draft. It's a, it's a year process of where you, your chair, and or dean will sit down, go through your portfolio. They basically will mentor you through the process. Add this, don't add this, reword this. If you get through your pre-tenure and with flying colors, the actual process of tenure now is going to become very easy because now it's just, I'm going to submit my final draft and I should get that A. You know, you should look at it kind of in, in, in that term. So the, that, that's the promotion document there. And again, it, it's, it just behooves you to, to become familiar with this, um, with all the performance criteria for the different levels, what, what's expected of an assistant professor as, a, as opposed to an associate professor, and then to a uh, full professor. Okay. So can you explain what the term, I know it says the commendable term there, um, does this translate into numbers, or, or how do we it does. know? Right here, excuse the italic. The term commendable in the description above means performance that is beyond merely meeting minimum expectations. So, so the two, and three and, and fours, okay. right? Okay, so minimum expectations are described as level two in the annual faculty evaluation instrument. So if you're just sitting at twos all the way, they're looking commendable. Mean, because at one time that was, they said that, but they weren't defined, okay, what does commendable mean? So we had to come up with a definition of what commendable is. So if, you, um, um, if you get any level ones, you're in deep weeds. 
uh, level twos if you get the six, a couple three years in a row and don't manage to bump that up to a level three at some point along the way, this becomes a hard case to make. So they're really looking for, particularly teaching effectiveness, you're looking at really trying to get some level threes while you're going along, and of course anything higher, right? But, uh, that, that's really what we did. Uh, uh, last year I got involved in a couple of discussions with this and that came up. And since UMHB is by choice, a, a, a teaching institution as opposed to a research institution, the great bulk of what we do is going to come out of those numbers is going to come out of the teaching effectiveness. Now, does that mean we don't want to see any kind of research? No, there's, there's still that going, man, they haven't written, I mean, they haven't done anything. They're great teachers, but no meetings, no conferences, no research, no collaborative anything. So that doesn't mean eliminate all research just because we're not a research based institution. That's still going to be important, but the major chunk is going to come out of that teacher effectiveness. Um, and again, that's where you're going to, uh, to find that. And then here is the tenure policy. And again, that is basically the same thing. It's a policy that looks very similar. Um, defines the tenure. It is one of the highest awards a faculty can achieve. Signifies a mutually supported relationship between the tenured faculty and the university. So basically, it's the university saying, we trust you. I mean, in the pure academic sense of the word, when you ask somebody, what does tenure mean? Most people will say job security. Because I mean, in the, in the everyday thing, of that's that actually what it means. But does anybody really know what tenure sig signifies, what it really truly means? In the academic world, tenure really is academic freedom. I now am so trusted by my university, by my institution, that it's not that I can say anything I want, but I am free to give my intellectual opinions without any threat of, well, you're up for promotion next year, you better watch that, what you're saying in philosophy class, because we don't necessarily, I'm good. The university now has a trust level in me. I've proven myself as an academic, as a scholar, therefore, I do have academic freedom. Of course, with all freedom comes responsibility. You know, we all know that. So it's a, it's a lot more than just the, oh, I've got a job type thing. And really, at this institution, as opposed to other institutions, tenure is not a life, it's not like Supreme Court. You know, It's not until I die. That just means I have a two-year contract. So if you do really bad, it's because you're in that period of a job. Okay, so instead of a one-year revolving contract, you go to a two-year contract. Okay, so, but you really have to do something, I mean, pretty bad to, you know, have your tenure revoked. It's happening. Yeah, Steve Olfett once just in a conversation about this said, you have to do something really bad or we discontinue your program. Just, the <laughs> university just basically gets out of the English business, you know, that, that, that there's a whole different thing going on. But, but that's in your contract anyway. Your right. contract states yeah. you cannot be terminated unless, and one of the option is, your program goes. If, if, you know, we don't have a theater program, there's a reason why we don't have a theater program. It's really not in our mission. It, we don't have the students to support it. And if we did have one or two theater professors, we had them adjunct at one time, we just don't have that program anymore. It, it does happen where a university of any kind has to make that decision of we can't support Sanskrit. We have no Sanskrit majors anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You're gotta go. All right, so, so much for that PhD. I know. Yeah. What a waste. Why did my parents tell me? <laughs> <laughs> so the whole thing uh, there again, all the definitions. If you were hired before 14, if you were hired after 14, same type of thing. It's exciting reading there on teacher effectiveness, professional attainment, scholarly productivity. This is the stuff you find on your evaluation. Okay. It's the same uh, headers. University service. Collegiality, and again, this is the biggie that we, this fall, actually, we started this summer in August with the committee of trying to define what is collegiality and how in the world do you measure it. So our committee right now is, is toiling with this idea of coming up with how do you measure collegiality? How do you measure he's, he's a good person, she's a great gal to work with. I mean, it's a really tough thing to do, but that's our charge and we're gonna have to figure, figure that out. 
One of the other red flags, as long as we're on this, I, I talked about leaving things out. Um, we've had a couple in the last few years applicants that, and again, we don't know whether it's oversight or if it was purposeful, that's why we have to go back and investigate. Uh, usually when you're up for tenure, you have to have supporting letters from other tenured professors in your department. Um, some departments have quite a few. Other departments that are younger maybe don't. Um, in my department, I think we only have three or four tenured faculty in the music department, uh, but we have a lot of younger guys that will be up in there at, at some point. Um, but if there are three to four tenured professors in your department and we only get one letter, we're gonna go, what? Where is the other supporting letters? They either got lost in the mail, the dog ate them, or you couldn't get your own faculty to support you. That's a red flag, okay? So those are where the committee starts going in and, and, and digging on those types of things. If we don't see a letter from your chairman or your <coughs> dean, that was one thing where the, the chair didn't even write a letter. And some, some chairs would rather not write a letter than write a bad letter, you know. And so that's that's one of those telltale signs as well. So, um, what about outside letters? Outside letters, they, they we have gotten outside letters. Um, they, does the committee require? No, so they come back and say the, why the committee. Don't have the committee does not require outside letters, but again, that's one of those. You know, you're coming from the corporate world and if you just got here and your only interactions with people have been for the last couple of years in that type of environment, we would almost expect that Kurt would yeah. supply a letter from his last boss or, you know, um, church dealings. If you're in church music and um, your, your professorship is here but you also serve a church, yeah, I want to know what your pastor thinks of you as well because that kind of goes into the whole mission of what Robert's doing here. So those types of outside letters, if it's from your neighbor, probably not. <laughs> what a great guy, that was a great partner. And it depends on the job. I know I have outside levels about colleagues who can attest to my presence at the national level, and I'm the only faculty developer here. Mm -hmm. So I have people at the national level write letters of support on my behalf, so. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, 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 if red flags would go up and you would you would go back and say we need we need um, to know why you don't have a letter or why you only have one or two outside no records. i mean the outside records are not and again if, if you've been here when i applied for tenure i was already here for seven years as an associate professor so the great majority of my so I, I wanted people here the, my outside stuff i had either seen for seven years or i only saw once or twice a year mm -hmm. or something like that so to me it was important it's cool but it's not important. So we, we really want to see everything from here. And then if you have something like a pastor, if you're serving a church as part of your job or something, then yeah, that becomes really important. Mm -hmm. Great. So those are there. What I would do is, some of you have time. Uh, is anybody doing this like right now? Dr. Eaton, Dr. Mm -hmm. Barnes, okay. So mm -hmm. become familiar with these types of things. I think it's really important that you utilize the either the people who have gone through it before in your department that really know about the departmental servings of what it is, what do I need to put in my entire book, all my manuscripts that I've written before or anything like that that are that pertain directly to your discipline. I think that's really important. Not that you know Robert couldn't go to the English department and say, What are you doing? or Sarah go to the math department and say, What are you doing? But, you know, the art professors who have done it before, those are the ones in your area that are particular to, to knowing what you have to do. So um, go over these, look at them, know what you're up against, know what your time frame is. You will always have a notification. You'll never be caught by surprise because the provost's office will always send out a letter that you are 